Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where every day we decode the complexities of technology, its impact on businesses and equally our lives. I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes, and today we've got a guest who's disrupting not just one, but two sectors, health and blockchain. I like looking after my health. I like blockchain, but I never thought about marrying the the two together. And for those reasons alone, we're going to welcome Oleg Fomenko, the co-founder of Sweat Economy, onto the podcast today. And it's a platform which is bridging the gap between physical health and economic productivity. So I want to learn more about the Sweat Economy, why it's so compelling, and its ingenious use of blockchain technology to incentivize physical activity, turning movement into currency. And with over 7 million users and counting, they're not just another D app. They are a top four decentralized app on DAP Radar, and it was built on the Near Protocol, boasting 800,000 plus monthly on-chain active users. So today, we'll talk about the sweat economy, recent news, the role of technology enhancing health and well-being, how Move to Earn improves economic productivity while lowering healthcare costs, and that critical balance between performance analytics and data privacy, especially in the fitness tech industry. And finally, how they're bringing the Web2 user experience finally into the Web3 world. It's a jam-packed agenda that explores the nexus of blockchain, health and economics, but enough for me. Buckle up and hold on tight because it's time for me to beam your ears all the way to Portugal, where today's guest is waiting to talk about all this and much more. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Well, I, well, thank you very much for having me here, Neil. Um, I'm Oleg. I'm one of the co-founders of Sweat Coin back in 2014, and now Sweat Economy, the Web three branch of uh, um, our business. And in 2014, we sat down and we thought, you know, how can we make the world more physically active? Well, to be fair, at that moment, we weren't thinking about the world. We went for a run. I could barely complete 5K, even though three years before that, I was climbing some of the highest mountains in the world. And I was really not happy about my level of fitness. And I started wondering what the hell happened. How is that possible that you go from fit as a fiddle to, <laughs> you know, passing out in Richmond Park? And, uh, you know, one word after another, we realized that the reason is very simple. Nature does not want you to be active. Nature does not want you to be fit. Nature builds us and optimizes us for survival, which means that we preserve calories rather than spend them. So from nature's perspective, doing all the pull-ups, push-ups, or runs, unless you run from saber to tiger that is about to eat you, <laughs> it's a pointless you know, action, so you shouldn't be wasting energy on that, or could be to kill mammoths, that makes sense, but you know, just going for a fun run, no, nature really does not give us, you know, kind of energy and motivation to be doing these things. So we kind of started thinking a bit more and we realized there is one way of tackling this, you know, massive problem, you know, because it's hard to fight nature. I mean, generally it's futile, right? And, uh, here, we kind of have to because the world has evolved. There's no more scarcity. Calories are coming in abundance. We really need to find a way to, you know, kind of to change our behavior. And what we realized is that there is a way to deal with this, to give instant gratification for steps. So we kind of went, mm -hmm. so if we turn step into gainful activity rather than calorie squandering activity in the back of your mind, that should change your behavior. So we launched Litcoin and miraculously it did work. You know, kind of, it's fascinating, but if you pay to walk, people tend to take more steps. Yeah. And <laughs> when we realized that they were taking a lot more steps, to be exact 20% more, and you know, that it was possible to turn it into a sustainable business. So it wasn't a charity, which a lot of people were accusing us. Then we just started scaling very rapidly, expanding into other markets. And as the name would suggest, Sweat Coin, we wanted to be on blockchain 
all the way from 2014. But we could not. Because back then, those that remember, uh, there was only one blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain. Too slow, too cumbersome, too expensive to build on. So we went, mm, okay, what's next? We spoke to Vitalik in 2015, but it was too early to build on Ethereum. And we decided, okay, we're going to go centralized. And probably within six months to a year, they're bound to be, you know, kind of other technologies emerging. So, you know, we'll find a partner and we'll build on them. Ha ha ha. It only happened in 2022 when we were able to actually launch on blockchain and we chose near and last September we launched outside of the U S and today we finally rectified a big, big, big strategic mistake that we made back then not going live in the U S and Pakistan and few other countries. And today we're fixing this and we totally align geographical footprint of our health and fitness applications with coin with sweat wallet, which is our non custodial uh, mobile application and our token sweat that you see here. It's incredibly cool. And I'm glad you shared your story there because I ran three half marathons in another lifetime. And I can't even run a mile now without being out of breath. So it's certainly something I'm going to be checking out. And and one of the things that you um, put put you on my radar really was when I was reading about the recent developments in the sweat economy, as you call it, that have been yeah. under embargo until recently. I think it was mid September it, it came out. But can you expand on on what happened there and what impact you anticipate these updates will have on your not just yeah. your users but the industry as a whole too. Yes. Now, um, as I mentioned, uh, when we launched last year, we did not launch in a number of markets and had yep. an art. I can't really give a very good reason for that other than we just had really bad legal advice. And, you know, when, as soon as we went live, I was barraged by our Bitcoin users from the US asking why on earth everybody else can literally walk into crypto. And we are excluded. And when the volume of these requests reached an absolutely phenomenal, you know, kind of volume, we really sort of started thinking, okay, you know, I, we can't really continue in this vein. People actually feel the need for this product. And because the nature of our project is to make you physically active, that's why we started the whole thing. That's how we made it sustainable so that's how we make money it is not the typical kind of crypto project that people you know sort of typically think about when you mention crypto right it's not some kind of derivative or a derivative you know we have a simple idea physical activity is valuable we tokenize it we turn it into tradable crypto token called sweat and together with millions and millions of users worldwide, we find the price that humanity is valuing physical activity at. Very simple. We all agree that physical activity has value. When I say these words, everyone nods because, I mean, clearly, you know, we want our families to be physically active. We know that, you know, they're in a better mood. They, you know, kind of, they're in a better state, you know, they're fitter and then pleasant to be around as well. And they'll live longer, which is great. Healthcare providers love it as well. I mean, we have a very, very big contract with National Health Service in the UK who pay us to make people diagnosed with diabetes more physically active because it's extremely valuable and helps people not to become diabetic, improves quality of life, extends their health span but also saves hundreds of thousands of pounds for the National Health Service that would otherwise go into insulin and medical treatment for, uh, for, this, uh, for these people. So there are a lot of first parties that are very interested and motivated in your physical activity. And our basic thesis is, if humanity were able to create a tension economy, which we all know, you know, kind of advertising, you know, Googles and Facebooks and all of that is a, you know, kind of an example of what, what comes out of it. 
which by some estimates is seven trillion dollars in size, seven times the size of the whole crypto. Then our thesis is that there is a movement economy out there because physical activity is very similar to attention. Both are valuable to you. Both are valued by third parties that are willing to pay for it. And both are scarce. And right now, the attention economy is $7 trillion and everyone understands it. Movement economy or physical activity economy does not exist at all. And that's what we're driving for, the creation of this economy and powering all of those use cases where you will be able to pay some of your insurance premiums in sweat because you're physically active. We'll be able to pay some of your taxes in sweat because that means that you're putting lower pressure on healthcare costs in the country that you're in. You're going to live longer and your total tax revenues that you will end up paying to a country are also going to be higher. So, you know, can this, it is a very, very big vision and we just want to make sure that sweat is not perceived as some kind of token and, you know, kind of the security is completely ludicrous conversation. What we are positioned as is the tokenized physical activity, the new asset class that everyone knows is valuable, but nobody knows yet what is the right price of it. So together, being global business, we will be able to find out. And within the next years, I'm sure we're going to have fair representation of the value of physical activity in the price of sweat. Incredibly cool. And one of the, well, first of all, I had no idea about the NHS contract you got there, which is also incredibly cool. And one of the things I try and do every day on this daily tech podcast is get people thinking differently about technology and the impact it can have on their lives and how we can do so much more than just endlessly scroll down a smartphone. So I'm curious, how do you see technology, specifically decentralized applications like the sweat economy, revolutionizing health and well being? And, and what are the pros and cons of? of integrating technology into personal wellness, do you think? I mean, it's, uh, it, it's hugely valuable, as I described to you at the very beginning, Yeah, to come up with idea of effectively creating instant gratification for steps. Yeah. That is very, very hard to implement without the use of technology. What well, I would go as far as to say it's impossible mm. because Yes, we had pedometers for the last 20 or 30 years, but they were not as prevalent and widespread as they are right now because they are now integrated in smartphones and everyone's got a smartphone. Very, very few people had pedometers. So it's not just the use of tech, but it's also accessibility and simplicity of using this tech and your ability to get this product into the pockets of tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people, that is really, really quite interesting here. And it's, it, you know, kind of technology has proven over the last, I don't know, probably 20 or 30 years that we can break uh, trade-offs that everyone considered safe and unmovable. For example, when internet came about, we managed, or we, humanity managed to break the uh, trade-off between rich and richness. What it used to be that if I wanted to deliver a very complicated, very elaborate message, I could only do it in individual conversation or in a small group. Maybe I will get on stage and I will be able to address a few hundred people, you know, maximum tens of thousands. Now, what you can do with the advent of the internet, you can have an ex extremely detailed and very elaborate message delivered to millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people. So we broke that trade-off which existed before, either many people with a very, very short message or few people with very rich message. And all of a sudden we were able to create attention economy. In modern world and in our minds right now, we have this really crazy trade-off, which is if you're talking about being physically active, being healthy, being fit, we automatically think that we need to pay for it because that's how everything works. You got to have gym membership. You got to buy sports kit. You got to hire a personal trainer, pay, 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 pay. But 
being physically active is not beneficial just to me. It is beneficial to so many other people out there that are willing to pay for it. So you can actually start seeing that this trade-off doesn't have to exist. And if we are starting to pay people to be healthy, the overall amount of economic impact is going to be way higher than the amounts that we actually need to pay. Because impact on healthcare costs is going to be a lot greater than the actual amounts that will need to change hands in order to motivate people to be more physically active. So let's break this trade off. Let's make sure that people who are healthy are actually rewarded and they're getting paid because that's going to create such an amount of change in the world and will make the world more physically active that will create a humongous amount of economic benefit for everybody, not just us, for everybody. Another way of thinking about it is think of attention economy again. Let's take an example of, uh, I don't know, Google business model, right? So they effectively take your attention and they sell it to advertisers and they get that as revenue. What do they give you in return? They give you free product, mm. right? Now, if you see how they've been doing economically over the last 20 years, you would suspect that they have not been returning a full value of attention to you. And they've been keeping a lion's share of it to themselves. And only the sliver of it was returned to us in the shape of free product. What we think is that we should not make the same mistake with physical activity economy, because here, bulk needs to go to people because that is the way better reason to actually create more physical activity, propel people further forward so that they move more and create more economic wealth for everybody. If we use the same model as Big Tech is using right now with attention, somebody will get rich, but actually people will not change their behavior and we would fail miserably in accomplishing the goal of making the world more physically active. And just to give you some perspective how far we are from being active, the average number of steps that Americans take per day is in the region of 3,000 steps, less than a third of what is recommended. In Europe, it's a little bit higher, it's about 5,000, but still half. So we have huge amount of work to be done to get us to just, you know, the lower end of recommended range live along, you know, kind of make us truly kind of sporty and fit. So I'm really, really excited. You know, kind of the, the, the ambition is huge. The field is completely green and we have an opportunity to use blockchain that has this reputation of being, you know, kind of money, 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 money use cases to be used to actually change people's lives and create a whole new asset class, physical activity, which makes even people in blockchain space extremely excited because all of a sudden it broadens their horizons and it broadens the ideas what you can build using this tech. And I think that this move to earn mechanism is incredibly intriguing and will be for a lot of people listening. And I love how incentivizing uh, physical activity could actually lead to economic productivity gains and reduce healthcare costs. And for anyone listening that may be thinking about giving it a run out, giving it a try. Can you just walk me through how they get up and running, what they need to do and what they can expect? Yeah, no, very, very simple. You open your um, iPhone or Android device, you go to App Store or Google Play and you type Sweat. The top app is going to be Sweat Coin. Install it, register, and you, you know, kind of off to races. That will allow you to track your steps and convert them. If you then want to move into, you know, walking into crypto, all you have to do is just find a banner that says walk into crypto, tap on it, follow probes, and you will effectively choose to generate instead of sweat coins, sweat, which is the crypto token, and you will install sweat wallet. As simple as that. Every app is free. They do not eat your battery we are not trying to make money by charging huge ticket prices at the door 
we actually want more people in because as you become more active, our revenues also grow. So it is really, really good business for us. And it is an amazing business for you. And as we mentioned, in an industry that does thrive on personal data for performance analysis, how do you at Sweat Economy better manage uh, and, and protect user privacy? Is it blockchain that's the key here? Um, no, in short. But European GDPR framework is by far the biggest sort of lever here. Yeah. All the data that we collect is sitting in Europe. Therefore, it is regimented by GDPR. We've never transferred or sold data to third parties. We don't do it, and we never will. But what we've learned over the last nine years in this business, that a lot of parties value this data tremendously, and we had a lot of offers to buy it off us. What we have decided to do is to wait until we're fully decentralized, I know if you go and you look at our history, we had some some of the biggest governance votes in history of Web3 have been conducted by us. The last one that actually cleared US launch and allocated budget for US launch had 380,000 people casting their vote. So we're making big strides in the in direction of decentralization and we'll continue doing so. Once we are fully decentralized, what we'll do is we'll build a data union that will allow you and you alone to be able to flick the switch and make your data accessible to third parties for analysis. And that will allow you to earn from those analytics. But we do not want to be sort of involved into that process because we do not believe that this data is ours and that it is up to us to decide where to put it, how much to charge for it. You know, you just, you know, call it silly. I mean, I know that in the US, a lot of people have a very different point of view, but this is also why we're based in Europe and why we really welcome GDPR as a framework that stipulates how we operate and how we treat our users' data. And I'm curious, what challenges did you face in bringing this Web2 experience into a Web3 ecosystem? And what do you think that means for the future of decentralized apps, particularly in terms of user accessibility and engagement, et cetera? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. It wasn't very easy because um, the understanding, you know, the deep understanding what blockchain capabilities are and what use cases, you know, it should be used for is not there. I mean, Let's face it, when you talk to a lot of people that sort of waded into blockchain and crypto in the last sort of five years, I guess from 2021, yeah. is because it was just booming and, you know, kind of people waded in because there was a place where they could make a quick buck. I'm not saying everybody, but many. Yeah. And this narrative and these actions have been overshadowing quite a lot of genuine innovation that is going on. And that is the reason why I am personally really, really quite positive about this crypto winter, because what I'm seeing is narrative chases and people who are not genuinely passionate about what they're building and the problems that they're solving are drifting away and losing their motivation and moving into AI or whatever the hyper and, you know, kind of halter area of uh, vocation is at the moment. And what it tells me is that the people that continue building and people that continue to do things, launching new geographies, are the people that will actually make a difference and will take full advantage of the next bull run and make their communities extremely happy in the process and on the way. So I'm just saying to everybody, look at it as a positive thing because the last bull run was crazy. Mm -hmm. There was so much rookery and thievery and rug pulling and everything. And it is right now coming to the surface. We do need to improve our act. We do need to clean the industry. And we also need to go through a bit of a catharsis to start seeing what are the real businesses that add value and solve genuine problems 
And good businesses are just Ponzi schemes that will die, you know, kind of untimely death within the space of weeks or months. And I think whenever we talk about the Web3 space, the big word that everyone talks about is adoption, bringing more people on board, getting them through the doors, as you said there. And as you build a marketplace, I'm curious, what strategies are you employing to help enhance that brand visibility, especially considering the, the global community that you're targeting and building here? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. I think the answer is very simple. You have to solve genuine problems of people as opposed to think that if you say Web3, they will run in. You know, kind of our research shows that right now, you know, people are kind of cautiously optimistic. Yes, they're interested in crypto in Web3, but nobody is going to be throwing money at uh, you know, just an idea that is giving them another trading opportunity or another derivative, etc. Mm. You know, there is a lot of innovation that we're seeing in kind of financial and you know, kind of reinventing tradfi space. But what happens there is it's kind of zero sum game because you end up shifting. You know, people end up shifting from one protocol to another, from one layer one to another, taking their liquidity with them. If we want to really drive adoption, we need to think not of another funky trading product, but we need to think about millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users out there, and what is the problem that we can solve for them using blockchain. Our approach is very simple. Everyone out there knows that physical activity is valuable. So far, no, no one was able to tokenize it and turn it into an asset that anyone in the world can own. And that can only be done with the help of blockchain. And that's why we're using it. We are not in blockchain because it was hot hip and we kind of thought that it would be really, really cool way of raising money. No. We started in 2014. We built sustainable business. And we went into crypto when technology has evolved enough to be able to support our scale. And we're seeing that people are moving more. They're engaging more. We are seeing that people who are engaging with crypto are actually changing their behavior, behavior and becoming more active than those that don't kind of flick the switch, that don't go into crypto. So definitely working to solve the problem and inadvertently bring people into Web3, but without making them very, very difficult choices, without them having to deal with 24 words, seed phrases, and all of that lucky. We make UX extremely simple, and we definitely do not ask people to pull credit card out and spend a few hundred dollars before they start seeing any advantage or benefits. We literally let people walk into crypto. Love it. I love that tagline too. And I think when it comes to user growth and community, you've got an incredible nice problem of having more than 7 million users and eight more than 800,000 monthly on-chain active users. So I've yeah. got to ask on behalf of other founders in this space, how did you manage to build such a, a robust community? And, and what role did that near protocol play in this too? I mean, near is the crux of it because it's the only chain that is able to sustain such a significant throughput. We looked at more than 14 different chains and we realized that it, you know they just couldn't simply carry us. And you know many of them have another issue which is very, very high price of transactions. Because when they say, oh my God, it's only 10 cents, it's like a fraction of what's on Ethereum, our users have three to five dollars. To pay 10 cents for a transaction is not something that they should be confronted with. So we really need to have high throughput, very low cost chain. And Nier has been absolutely incredible technology that was able to support us. Sweat now is the ninth widest held token, 13th most actively used token. And Nier is carrying us without any problems. And if we grow 10x, it will just add few more shards and we'll be able to cater 
to these new requirements, which is absolutely incredible. But let me go back to my previous point, which is the reason why we have these users and the reason why they're so active is because we give them solution to a genuine problem and we are really, really busy building an engaging product as opposed to clever tokenomics product that has shitty user experience and is not thinking about ongoing and constant engagement. You cannot make a game fly by having clever tokenomics. You cannot make you know, can a project fly just on tokenomics alone? It needs to solve genuine problem. It needs to be really, really well designed and well researched and not use hodl, biddle, finality, and all of that terminology that turns off the mass market. And, you know, kind of present it in a very, very kind of user friendly way. This is the stuff that we're seeing more and more. There is another project that is building on Nier called Cosmos or k Chain. You know, similar thing. They're solving real user problem and they're using Nier and blockchain to solve certain aspects of this problem to lower cost, increase speed, etc., etc. Let's stop developing another DEX derivative of a 15 whatever variable that only three people in the world can actually understand what it is, let's start building pro products for billions of people. Our conversation today has focused on introducing people to the sweat economy and the movement economy and the great work that you're doing here. And we will have, though, a few people from your loyal, should I say, a few of your loyal community members listening, hanging on your every word, waiting to hear if there's anything that you reveal or drop in this episode. And I appreciate you might not be able to share too much, but where do you go from here? Where do you see the sweat economy and the broader movement economy heading and any plans for partnerships, expansions or pivoting? Is, is there anything you can leave your, your community members with? Yeah, no, there is, uh, there, is, the, the, there is some really exciting stuff that is already happening right now, but will be, you know, kind of, rippling through the community and will be delivering long-term benefits to everybody. I mean, one is, we call it DeFi jars. So our grow jars, which is the way we call the product that generates interest to you instead of staking, because staking is just not a term that you know most people understand. We have just migrated all of it onto smart contracts. And we also build it in a way that ensures that if you put some principle into that grow jar, nobody ever other than you can retrieve it from there. So we remove that biggest risk that staking protocols have run into where you bring in the asset, you give it to someone and they give it to Gnosis or FTX or wh whoever pays the highest interest. And if they go bankrupt, the whole amount is gone completely. We completely remove this risk. We don't want to take this sweat that you are putting into grow jars and invest it anywhere. The reason why we're doing this product is very simple. It is like a loss leader in the supermarket. You know, when you go to the supermarket, you see really, really cheap product at the door. You go, oh, yeah. oh, amazing deal. You go in, supermarket loses money on that product. But if you look at the whole basket that you're walking out with, it is a good business for them. Same thing that we do with the staking product or with the grow jars. We want to have it in sweat wallet to make sure that every person who owns sweat and who works for sweat is engaging with our wallet. And they have a reason to constantly be around and explore other things that you know kind of we can give them in exchange for sweat. The other thing that is extremely exciting is called meta transactions. It sounds kind of horribly technical, but in essence, what it is, it is possible for you to pay network fees or blockchain gas fees instead of near using sweat. Yeah. And we already moved quite a lot of functionality of sweat wallet onto these rails. So you don't have to think about near token on your account in order to use near. 
And what we think, you know, is the next step. Can we actually extend that to multi-chain gas fees? Because right now, as soon as you start going multi-chain, your head breaks in, you know, I need one token here, then I need another token there, and it just makes it into absolutely messy and extremely complicated experience. We think that we can master it so that you would be able to pay all of your fees by moving one foot in front of another, no matter what chain you're on. So the team that has been busy with US launch and preparation and all of the stuff that you know kind of went live today is shifting their focus and attention into this functionality, which is really exciting because basically imagine that you have an app that you know you can use on whatever chain, but all the feeds are always taken care of by you moving one foot in front of another. That's cool. It's incredibly cool. And I can't thank you enough for coming on here and sharing the story behind it as well but before i let you go i always like to have a bit of fun with my guests so we we have a spotify playlist here where i ask my guests to leave a song and i've also got an amazon wish list so i ask my guests to leave a book i don't mind which you leave today but what would be that final parting gift that you'd recommend for listeners to check out from that song or book what, what are you going to leave us with you know um one of the first playlists i had created on Spotify, which was before they even went live, was called Songs Made of Wood, which were including songs that only had, you know, kind of guitar and voice. And then I actually went even more purist and I started adding only songs that basically had a voice and percussion. And the song that I had the whole morning playing in my head, probably because we're launching in the U.S., is uh, Janis Joplin's uh, Mercedes-Benz. Oh. Um, I absolutely love it. And the story of it, that she passed away within 24 hours of recording that uh, uh, song, is uh, absolutely incredible. And to me, this is the sort of quintessentially something from the 60s and 70s, the rebellious freedom of the United States. So I'd probably go with that song. But if you ask me tomorrow, that could have been completely different. So, you know, it's not like I'm diehard uh, Janis Joplin fan. And the book, I would uh, go with the latest one that I'm actually really enjoying reading right now is the biography of uh, Elon Musk. I know that's very, very trivial, but if you haven't, I would actually recommend to read it because some of the details of his biography, especially his early life, have certainly not penetrated my skull because that definitely explains quite a lot of things and put his actions and the way he sort of behaves and communicates in a very, very different light. Awesome. Well, I'll get both of those added to our list. So a big thank you there. And for anybody listening that we've just hooked today, we've set off those light bulb moments. They want to get involved in the sweat economy. They want to come in the doors. Where would you recommend everyone listening check out? And is there a community that they can join too? Where would you point everyone? Absolutely. I mean, we have more than a million people in, you know, kind of engaging with us on a regular basis. So the biggest one is probably Discord. Um, so it's sweat economy one word twitter or x uh also sweat economy um you can find me on twitter oleg underscore f e m um we also on telegram um sweat economy so just search for sweat economy uh or open our website sweateconomy.com you're gonna find light paper and links to all of our social channels there very very simple Awesome. Well, I like get all the links added so people can find you nice and easily. As I said very early in the podcast, I love trying to get people thinking differently about technology and how they can use it to be more productive or improve their life. And for me, just listening to you there talk about the role that tech can play in improving our health and well-being, how move to earn, earn can enhance economic productivity, lowers healthcare costs, and also how you're bridging that Web 2 user experience to Web 3 by building a marketplace and the value of uh, brand visibility to global communities that you're delivering to. 
all pure gold from my side. But just thank you for taking the time to sit down and share it with me today. Thank you very much for having me, Neil. And uh, yeah, GM uh, in our world is get moving. So, you know, get moving, everybody. You can get healthier and wealthier in one go. And it's free. Well, that was an illuminating discussion, wasn't it? Huge thank you to Oleg for sharing such groundbreaking insights into how technology can serve as a catalyst for improving not just personal health, but economic productivity. And I think it's fair to say that the sweat economy is at the forefront of demonstrating how blockchain can be applied to real-world issues in a way that is both impactful and sustainable. And for everyone listening who wants to learn more about the sweat economy and the high-level mission to inspire a healthier and wealthier planet through all forms of movement, I highly recommend checking out that platform, which is capturing the imaginations of millions worldwide. I'll be checking it out and I will report back. But that's it for today. So let me know your experiences with the platform. Uh, email techblogwriter at outlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, just at Neil C. Hughes. Nice and easy to find. Let me know your thoughts. But other than that, time for me to go. I've got another great guest lined up for tomorrow, though. So thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Stranger.